uh, challenge, how it helps the bank that gives us a platform to to learn about South Africa's history and how Mandela has changed uh, uh, South Africa's history, right? I think I didn't realize just how much like Mandela's legacy makes me into that Mandela's legacy really to me means like it means that um, I get
to the defiance campaign in the 1950s, to the treason trial, to, to the armed struggle, to Rotten Island. I mean, that's 60 years of a man who was putting himself at the front of every major campaign of African people and of the people in general. So, and so when we speak about Mandela, let us stop talking about Mandela in the 1990s. Let us speak about Mandela as a historical figure. And then, when you do that, you begin to appreciate the sacrifice of the man. And it really helps you that you have young people born into freedom, into peace that people, will call somebody like that a seller. And one thing I find saying over and over again is know what you're talking about. Yes. So I think when people volunteer their opinions, they must be based on something. So for instance, if you're going to talk about um, Nelson Mandela being at Victor Fister and being sort of brainwashed, I need to know where that comes from, what your evidence is on that. When he came out of prison, I remember when I was one of the first ones to go and meet him at Victor Fister, and we were talking about the speech that he had to make. And he came out of that and made a speech in the... In the Outside the city hall at Cape Town saying, I stand before you as a humble servant. He didn't say, I stand before you as a prophet. We have an inability as a society to hold on to paradoxes. We want to operate in buying nations. He is like a one. So either right or wrong. Either he's a sellout or he was the icon of freedom. Well, he did make mistakes. He did silence people. Right? But he was also a democrat. Now, uh, I think that what we can do with an historical approach is precisely to bring all those complexities to the fore and not try and uh, construct a Mandela that is one-sided to suit our contemporary ideologies and, and <laughs> anxieties. I mean, look at the history of this country. I think it would be arrogant of any one of us to think that single-handedly, even from an organizational point of view, single-handedly, we liberated this country. It's a false notion. Simple as I want to be incredible symbol of what is good. But you mustn't destruct or be reduced history to big names because it's easier for us to sell what we want to sell. The fact that I am the first African, just think about that.
Ladies and gentlemen, please settle into your seats. The event will start in 15 minutes. Please settle into your seats. The event will start in 15 minutes. No, 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 no. I just come from here. You see that? Thing? I'm going to read your book, Olive.
Gentlemen, please note that the event will start in five minutes. Please settle into your seats. The event will start in five minutes.
Welcome the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Mr. Selo Hatta. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> you know, with the stadium so full, surely you can at least greet back, unless if the mics are not working. Good afternoon. This is a very exciting moment for us and we'd like to welcome you to the 16th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. It fills us with pride to then have you all here. We have managed for the first time in the history of the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture to have 15,000 people sitting in this stadium. I'd like you to please help me as I call our dignitaries to the stage. Please help me welcome the chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation of Trustees, Professor Njabulo Ndebele. Please help me welcome Mama Grasa Marshall. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the President of South Africa, Ndate Cyril Ramaphosa.
help me welcome our partner for the 16th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture, Ntate Motsepe. I guess at this point, you all know who I'm going to call. I, I haven't said anything. Please help me welcome the, pres the former president of the US, President Barack Obama. Without sitting down, I would like us to please sing the national anthem of South Africa. This will be rendered by the Soweto Gospel Choir. I, I have to tell you that I tried to audition and they rejected me. And uh, I'm still trying to sing for the Soweto Gospel Choir. So I'll still try, Prof. There they come.
Thank you very much. Uh, Soweto Gospel Choir. They will be back again later when they will be singing together with Kirk Wallam and Tandiswa Mazwai. So there will be a music tribute at the end. Now, I'd like you to please help me welcome someone actually who was so brave when uh, she's surrounded by these uh, men and they were trying to get hold of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and she said, I will do it. Uh, and we are collaborating with them at the moment. And uh, this young lady, we will be, she will be our program director for the day. Please help me welcome Busi Mkumbuzi. President Cyril Ramaphosa, President Barack Obama, Mrs. Grasa Marshall, Professor Njabulo Ndebele, Dr. Patrice Mutipe, and Mr. Silo Hatan. Your Excellencies, Heads of States and Government, past and present, Honorable Ministers, Members of Parliament, Provincial Premiers, mayors and all members of government, leaders of opposition parties, veterans of the liberation struggle, former Nelson Mandela lecture speakers, business leaders and leaders of faith-based organizations, political and social activists, members of the Mandela family, distinguished guests, fellow South Africans, and the world. It is an honor to stand before you today to celebrate the centenary of Nelson Holihlahla Mandela. Whom former President Barack Obama describes as more than a man, but as being a symbol of the struggle for justice equality and dignity in South Africa and all across the globe. In 1994, the year of my birth, Madiba emerged as president of a democratic South Africa. From the onset, he was committed to turning a country torn apart by years of colonialism and apartheid into a fully functioning democracy where all South Africans are equal before the law. And yet, despite our notable progress, the situation right now in the world calls on us to reflect deeply. Global political trends portray a concerted assault against the democratic values that Mandela and his contemporaries espoused. All over the world, there is a resurgence of racial and class exclusivity, of nationalism, and the maintenance of gross inequality through corruption and systematic greed. Patriarchy persists at the peril of women and the LGBT community. We did not think that so far into democracy, so many people would again face the threats of losing their elemental rights, their freedom, and their dignity. This is therefore an auspicious occasion, ladies and gentlemen, to reflect on the principles and values that defined Mandela's life and legacy. Principles such as tolerance, inclusivity, reconciliation, and the rule of law. These principles underpin Madiba's legacy and can heal the world of its social ills. These principles also broke the political deadlock in the 90s, and I truly believe that they need to be invigorated in 2018.
standing before you as a young black woman born and bred in the sprawling working class townships of Soweto, this occasion must especially motivate the youth. It must motivate them to take the forefront in the endless struggle to sustain livelihoods globally. During this centennial celebration of Madiba's birth, I encourage all dignitaries, institutions of government, business, and all fervent supporters of Mandela's legacy to put their weight behind the youth who I believe are the true custodians of our future. With no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, to mark the opening of this special occasion, it is a great privilege to welcome the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. He is an established scholar who has been a key figure in South African higher education, an author whose critical and creative writing have tackled the effects of apartheid on black communities, protest, democracy, and reconciliation. Please give a resounding applause to Professor <coughs> Njabulon Debeli. President Ramaphosa, President Obama, Mama Michelle, Dr. Patrice Mutsipe, and so many distinguished guests who out there who have graced our occasion with your presence. And ladies and gentlemen, all of you from far and near, on behalf of the trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, I welcome you to this, the 16th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Thank you for joining us in your numbers to remember Madeba on the eve of what would have been his 100th birthday, and for doing so by coming to listen to a lecture by an extraordinary leader, President Barack Obama. This is the biggest Nelson Mandela lecture we have ever hosted. Something eminently appropriate, I think, for the centenary. Our late trustee, the venerable Ahmed Kathrada, never stopped demanding that we should hold the lecture in a stadium. Today, he has finally got his wish. <laughs> 28 years ago, with one hand clasped around the hand of Mama Winnie Matigedezala Mandela, the other The other raised in a fist. Nelson Mandela walked out of Victor Festa prison into a country waiting for his leadership. Would he, outside prison at last, continue to inspire as much as he had done when he was inside? In a racially polarized society where political friends and enemies were frighteningly easy to identify by skin color. Few South Africans were aware just how Mandela's release represented a unique and unexpected ways, the complex art of the possible. It required that he take enormous personal risks to lay foundations for a negotiated end to over three centuries of racist, economic, and social oppression in South Africa. 
he had to find a way of cutting across embedded histories, structures of governing, and the human attitudes they had given life to over time. He had to find a way for South Africans to begin to see one another differently. It was a task that required a particular kind of leader. Now, for this particular leader, there are countless anecdotes that individually capture some essence of him. The anecdotes collected recently and published in one of our centenary publications, which bears the title, I Remember Nelson Mandela, makes for a most joyous read that I recommend. These anecdotes are told by many from various stations of life who worked for Madiba or for his organizations. But today I want to recall a, a personal all-time favorite anecdote of mine. It is not in that book. Richard Stenger, who collaborated with Nelson Mandela on his autobiography, The Long Walk to Freedom, tells that particular one. And here it goes. We were once on this airplane flight down in Natal, and it was a prop plane. I think there were six seats in it, and there were maybe four of us in the plane. As soon as he gets in an airplane, he, Madiba, picks up a newspaper. He adores newspapers. For many years, he didn't have them and revels in the touch of them and he reads every stupid story. And so we were sitting on this plane. The plane was up and he was reading his newspaper and we were about, I don't know, halfway there. And I saw to my great horror that the propeller had stopped going round. And he said very, very calmly, Richard, you might want to inform the pilot that the propeller isn't working. <laughs> I said, yes, Madiba. I walked to the front of the plane and the pilot was of course well, well aware of it and said, go back and sit down. We've called the airport. They have the ambulances out there and they are going to coat the runway with foam or whatever they do. So I went back and told that to Madiba, and he just, in that very solemn way of his mouth sort of down, listened and said, yes. <laughs> and then picked up his newspaper and started reading. I was terrified, and I calmed myself by looking at him, and he was as calm as could be like the prisoners on Robben Island that must have looked at him when they felt scared, he just looked as calm as could be. Well, the plane landed safely while Madiba retained his calm and flustered expression all the way as we stopped off the plane. But when they entered the airport, Madiba took advantage of a quiet moment with Stengel to make an unexpected confession. Man, he said, I was scared up there. <laughs> so. so Madiba was able to put up the armor of self-composure to mask the turmoil and fear and uncertainty that was churning inside of him. The best part is by far in his honesty to give words to his fears at the appropriate moment. There's a certain grandeur to it. This story displays something else about Madiba. It shows up Madiba, the politician. Surprisingly, Madiba, the actor. He could enter the universe of all those he met, each and every one of them, 
at home and everywhere in the world and be remembered universally for the genuineness of that particular moment. The actor in him was able to remove from the politician any semblance of guile. At the same time that the politician gave to the actor the semblance of power to effect change. In him, we could see an intriguing coexistence of power and beauty. It is a coexistence of attributes that he bequeathed to us in the hope that 24 years after the birth of our constitutional democracy, we will be more powerful and even more beautiful. Through Madiba the actor, this displayed in this anecdote. I want to pay tribute, therefore, to all actors, artists, writers, dancers, musicians, who in their different art forms are able to feel intensely the characters they become, the thoughts they think, the feelings and emotions they feel deeply. They make real the experience of being truly alive. And being truly alive is what all South Africans today have to become once more through an act of will and the courage to be clear-minded and steadfast in moments that require them to be courageous. <laughs> there are many South Africans today in government in their political parties, in offices of traditional authority, in their trade unions, in their churches, in their schools, and in their governing councils, and in their sports associations. They all play important leadership roles, but some will, by willful intent, have caused the propeller of the airplane of state to stop going round in midair and who will go on to read a newspaper, see themselves in it, and pretend to be completely innocent. Some will even call a press conference and then say nothing at it. <laughs> These are the characters that actors get to play as a bad guy. We saw in our Madiba anecdote the ability in a leader to suppress inner fears in order to be brave for other people. That way, people sharing a genuinely dangerous and precarious moment with a leader draw courage from a leader in the appearance of courage displayed by him. He then owns up to that moment later by revealing the fear he experienced after the fact. That way, he enables us to participate in the personal yet public dimensions of being human. I call on all those among our leaders who wear the faces of innocence to stop being the bad guy, step out of the airplane of those whose propeller they had willfully stopped, and after a safe landing, emerge from that plane and say, man, I have been corrupt. I am certain that Madiba would have approved as you do. <laughs> Let us remember those four years of difficult negotiations in which despite some significant loss of life, South Africans did not slide into a bloodbath of a racial war. Madiba's compass remained steadfast and trusted. With the birth of a new democracy achieved, Madiba as president of the new Republic of South Africa, spent five years 
building constitutional, legislative, political, economic, and social coherence to support and promote a new democracy. Let us remember that the South African constitution and the society envisaged by it placed participative humanity and belonging at its core. Such would be the country that Madiba dreamed of. His dreams were shared at the time by all political parties, trade unions, business institutions, civil society organizations, communities, and families throughout the land that all agreed to work together in a constitutional democracy to achieve these dreams. No one ever before, none ever before, had been head of state of South Africa for all the people of South Africa. Time, tirelessly, he worked to ensure that our democracy would become more strong. Indeed, it was strong enough to survive the predations and devastations of the last 10 years. Too many South Africans in that time have been left behind. Too many have become deeply alienated. Too many believe they have nothing to lose. The new governing party administration has provided strong evidence of a determination to clean up and fix broken institutions and restore the best hopes of a nation. But the demand from those left behind is for a fundamental transformation of our society. We give strength to our new president to rise to the occasion. to rise to the challenge with all of us fellow citizens by his side. Now, 10 years ago, progressive people around the world welcomed the election of a new president of the United States, Barack Obama. <clears throat> a leader who sought to bring hope and renewed optimism to a democracy more than 200 years old. To many, the Obama presidency offered the United States a dream of a global future that people could aspire to, one that inspired belief in human solidarities that could be forged across national, economic, social, and cultural divides. The realities of office, of course, tested him to the limit. Embedded histories and resilient structures of power proved to be formidable obstacles. Inclusivity as a democratic ideal had not become strong enough over the centuries of democracy to keep at bay racism, official forms of violence, and class-based insecurities that take on an ethnic, racial, and nationalistic forms of expression. Too many observers, to many observers, what we came to see in South Africa as a state capture seemed mirrored in the United States and other parts of the world by what we could call more accurately a capture of democracy. In this scenario, hostile forces uh, to democracy ultimately attain legitimate electoral mandates only to subvert them. Public discourse shifts from the language of social cohesion to that of validating membership in what could be called political tribes. The persistence of structural racism and of denialism in relation to received structural privilege deepens historic device, as do the whims of the market, structured through five centuries of global capitalism. Consequently, multitudes of people across the world live below basic poverty levels on the margins of in every other sense. In the centenary year of Nelson Mandela, we welcome the voice 
of President Obama to this platform. He has confronted the global challenges I have alluded to in ways that very few have. He has been in the crucible in ways reminiscent of Madiba during the dangerous, turbulent years of the 1990s here in South Africa. He has things to tell us which are worth listening to. He has ideas which I believe will need us to strive to hear the call of justice and begin to reimagine democracy. To conclude, let us find the Madiba in each of us. Let us be the legacy. Let's be the citizen who creates with other citizens our common future to restore beauty, purpose, dignity, and strength to our country. Let us be enriched by this beautiful day. I thank you. <clears throat>
the, the chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and the CEO, uh, the king of the Zulu nation, Isilo Samabanja, and all traditional leaders and uh, kings who are here with us. Uh, His Grace Bishop Bonabas Lekhanyani, and all of the religious leaders and faith-based leaders who are here with us. And of course, in conclusion, uh, recognition of all our ministers. I saw former President uh, Kalima Mutlante. Um, Kuluam, welcome. You, you know, when we met uh, many years ago in the way we did, we'd always say, Ola Madiba Ola. Ola Madiba Ola. Ukonu Moya Wagamadiba La. Minanya Guza Moya. Moya wa Mandela Uteng, Moya wa Lerato le wa Kopano. And uh, uh, so, and it's eindelijk ook belangrijk. And the geest van Mandela is het belangrijk dat ons allemaal samen is. Is prachtig. And everything is stood for. Now, uh, in 1994, when Nelson Mandela was inaugurated, it was a deeply, deeply emotional it was a historic day, but a deeply, deeply emotional day for all of us. And uh, I remember uh, my wife and I, Precious, we, we shed a tear because I think many South Africans were very emotional. We, we never thought that we would live to see Mandela take that oath as president of this country and unite all of us and give hope and inspiration to all of us. But uh, President Obama, we had the honor of uh, also going to your inauguration in 2009, as well as in 2013. And uh, we, we left and worked in America for some time. And to see you, uh, a president whose father grew up in Africa, take the oath and say, so help me God was a deeply, deeply emotional experience for all of us. And on that day as well, we also shed a tear. And uh, because it was living proof that in America, as well as in anywhere else in the world, and particularly in South Africa and in Africa, every young man, every young girl, through hard work and sacrifice, can realize the very, very highest of their dreams. And your presence here And your presence here is, is a strong indication of that inspiration, that hope, and, and that belief in self, self ability and, uh, and, and the realization that indeed through hard work and sacrifice, our young people and, and all of us as a nation can realize the dreams that Madiba stood for and the dreams that each of us uphold. I think all of us have very special memories of uh, Nelson Mandela. And uh, when I was asked to say a few words on behalf of the Mutsipe Foundation, I uh, thought of two occasions that came to mind. On the one occasion, we had a meeting with Madiba as business leaders. And I think the meeting was in Senton, at the Senton Convention Center. And uh, a few months afterwards, we, we had another meeting. And he called me aside. And, and he called me aside. And he said to me, uh, there was something I liked in what you said at the business meeting at the convention center. And I was a bit embarrassed because that meeting was so many months ago. And I didn't remember what I had said. So I, I sort of humbly asked, uh, Tata, can you please remind me what did I say? Uh, so I said, please remind me what did I say? And he said, at that meeting, we made a statement that the future of the successful, the future of the educated, the future of the wealthy in South Africa and the future of the families of the successful and wealthy is not bright, 
And in fact, they do not have a future if the poor and the unemployed and the marginalized have a future. And, and, and that memory stuck with me for, for many, many years afterwards. And that was partly why in 1999 uh, we formed the Mutsepe Foundation and in, and, and in 2013 joined the Giving Pledge because it was also part of a recognition that all of us are what we are because of the people of this country, because of the sacrifices, because of the hard work. All of us in our lives had somebody who gave us a helping hand. And there's a huge, huge obligation on those of us who who are in a position to make a humble contribution to give those who are less fortunate a brighter future. What is also important, particularly in this uh, era of corruption, in this era of uh, people in various positions of authority, particularly in government, but, the gov but corruption is not confined to government. Many of us in the private sector also have to be very, very careful. In fact, uh, in most cases, in order for you to have a corrupt politician, you need an equally corrupt businessman or an equally corrupt entrepreneur. In, in many instances in South Africa and in Africa and in many parts of the world, the initiators of corruption are, are us, business people, those of us in the private sector. And, and it is very, very, very important. There are so many people who sacrifice so deeply and many of them paid the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. There's a huge duty and a huge obligation on all of us to make sure, on all of us in the business community, on all of us in the private sector, to make sure that in our interactions and engagements with politicians, with senior politicians, and particularly with those politicians that those of us in the business community may have a relationship with, that we behave in a manner that reflects zero tolerance of corruption, zero tolerance of any insinuation of improper conduct, and it's even more important that corruption is, is not just seen to be not tolerated, but that in the minds of ordinary South Africans, there is indeed a perception that, that there's a huge commitment to zero corruption and to uproot corruption. Now I'm going to, it's fine, you can clap hands, it's fine. I'm, I'm now going to sit down and I, I want to conclude by saying that uh, once more, welcome home, Barack. You, you inspire us immensely and we want to continue working with you to uh, those values of equal opportunities, equal access to opportunities for ordinary citizens and particularly for the poor and for young girls and the values of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of association, the sort of universally accepted values that gives hope and gives inspiration that we adhere to them and uphold the legacy and the values of Mandela and, uh, and make sure that we build in this country the best place for all our people. South Africans are caring people, South Africans are loving people, and together we will make this the best place in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Dr. Motsepe. I think something that came through in his speech that many people don't in fact know is that Dr. Motsepe has very strong activist and political convictions. And that if we all have those convictions driving whatever work we do, 
the fruits of the work that we do becomes uplifting. We in fact extend this Hola Madiba Hola in December when the Global Citizen Festival and the Matsipa Foundation bring Beyonce <laughs> to South Africa. <laughs> With that being said, I now welcome our next speaker. Born in Gaza, Mozambique, she is a member of the Mozambican Liberation Front, which fought for and won independence in 1975. She is a humanitarian, a global advocate for women and children's rights, and an international stateswoman in her own right. She was married to Nelson Mandela from 1998 till his death. And when describing her, he once said that she makes him bloom like a flower. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to invite Mrs. Grassa Marshall to the podium. President Cyril Ramaphosa, <laughs> I can see Madiba smiling to hear me calling President Ramaphosa. <laughs> President Barack Obama, Barack, I can't say how much I'm thrilled that you accepted our invitation to honor this occasion and to give us the opportunity once again to celebrate you too. So I welcome and we are looking forward to listen to you. Professor Njabulu Debele, Patrice, my son, Busi, my daughter, honorably Honorary dignitaries and the esteemed guests here today. My two big families, the Mandela family, the Michelle family. My very special brothers and sisters, the elders who are here represented. All of you South Africans, today you are very special. Good morning. No, it's afternoon. Good afternoon. I am overjoyed to learn of uh, the multitude of festivities organized by governments, civil society organizations, businesses, entertainers, and individual citizens, including Madiba's grandchildren, from every corner of the globe commemorating Madiba's centenary and honoring the values he embodied. I can certainly say with no hesitation that these celebrations make Madiba incredibly happy and proud. I'd like to thank the Nelson Mandela Foundation for being a watchful custodian of Madiba's legacy and offering an important platform for public discourse and meaningful dialogue in the form of these Nelson Mandela annual lectures. In conjunction with the Nelson Mandela Foundation, I salute all the legacy institutions Madiba established, for they hold a special place in the grand kaleidoscope of organizations carrying out the important work of social transformation. I mean here, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital, the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, the Mandela Institute for Development Studies, and the elders. These organizations were personally founded or endorsed by Madiba 
and their mandates carry his blessing. Thank you for your tireless efforts to advance the causes that he held so dear. Madiba Centenary is an opportunity to acknowledge his incredible uniqueness in all its forms. Let us not celebrate him singly as an individual, however. As given the humble and modest man that he is, he sees himself as a representative of a broader collective leadership. Madiba's legacy is a rich tapestry woven over 100 years with the threads and colors of generations of leaders who came before him, as well as those who sat as his contemporaries. Let me pause here and ask you to celebrate with me Mama Albertina Sisulu, who also is turning 100 years this 2018. And with loud and loud so that Mama can hear, Utita Basadi, Utita Bokodo. Hello, Mama, we love you. Over decades, he was a student, Madiba was a student of African heritage and leadership traditions. He took close note of the philosophical leanings of a wide range of thought leaders. He dutifully analyzed the approaches of freedom fighters, political prisoners, and heads of state. He was also inspired by the activism of uh, artists creatives. The struggle hero, the skillful strategist, the visionary statesman, the global icon he is considered today, is a proud, is a product, I'm sorry, of this collective leadership. The tapestry of his legacy is woven by generations and generations of great thinkers and strategists, freedom fighters in all their interactions, as well as the unnamed and unknown who picked his imagination, sharpened his keen intellect, and kept his moral fortitude alight. As we celebrate him and honor his contributions to the world, we must remember that while his political party, the African National Congress, strategically thrust him forward as the symbolic face of the struggle and the world embraced him as such, he was not acting in singular isolation. He, in fact, regarded himself as a representative of a much broader, powerful conglomeration of activists who in their unique and varied ways were driving the attainment of political freedom. He considered himself a simple foot soldier. We remember on his jubilant release, he exclaimed, I quote, I stand here before you, not as a prophet, but as a humble servant of you, the people. We the people need unifying symbols in which we rally around. And we often elevate symbols to take, who take on the dreams and aspirations of millions of us to deity-like status. Madiba became selfless symbol of unrelenting resistance, of hope, of resilience, and of victory. He embodied the sacrifices, courage, and the determination of millions who worked in concert to overthrow the evils of apartheid. Perhaps his resolute commitment to his ideals in the face of seemingly unsurmountable odds, his incredible strength of character and integrity, and his affirmation 
of the narrative that indeed good can triumph over evil are why we admire and we revere him so. Madiba internalized the courage and determinations of his own people and gave the absolute best of himself to give to South Africa its political freedom. But even having achieved the highest aspirations of humanity, the Madiba I know is a simple, grounded, and humble man. I want to share with you one of the moments where this humility expressed itself so genuinely. Madiba was attending the 75th birthday of his close friend and comrade, George Bezos. The event was a star-studded affair with anti-apartheid struggle heroes, VIPs from around the world in attendance. He was getting on in age by then and was not in a position to enjoy the festivities well into the night. So we agreed he would attend for a brief while and would then make our exit. We arrived to find an entourage of well wishes welcoming him to the party. As guests greet him and as each of speakers took to the stage, they were singing his praises and bestowing upon him the most flattering of compliments. We were not in the room for more than 30 minutes, but each minute was filled with obvious displays of affection and love for him. With each accolade, he graciously smiled, nodded in appreciations, and thanked them for their kind words. As we leave and we are driving home and reflecting on the lovely evening, he turned to me and in genuine curiosity, he questioned, Mom, because he used to call me Mom. He said, Mom, don't you think these people are exaggerating? I'm not at all these things they are saying about me. His self effacing disbelief made me chuckle, and I gently reassured him, and I said, no, Papa, they're not exaggerating. Yes, you are indeed all these wonderful things they said tonight, because you represent the best of what so many of us aspire to be. He nodded in seeming agreement, but I could tell he did not fully believe me. You see, he was cognizant of the fact that he was a flawed human being and said in many occasions that he was not a saint. The stature to which he had risen and the symbol of virtue that he had become did not shake him into pompous arrogance. Despite his monu monumental achievement, his incredible influence and impact, and overwhelming fame and notoriety, the essence of who he was and his level of self-awareness had never been altered. His sober view of himself was that of uh, many times you would say, I am a country boy. Madiba was humble enough to recognize the limits of the achievements of his generation. He wisely wrote in his long work to freedom, and I quote, the truth is that we are not yet free. We have merely achieved the freedom to be free the right not to be oppressed. We have not taken the final step of our journey, but the first step on a longer and even more difficult road. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom 
of others, unquote. Madiba and his Thank you. Madiba and his contemporaries laid a solid base for today's generation to now stand free and unconstrained in the continued long world for equality and prosperity for all. They provided the enabling environment for the youth of today to build on foundations of political emancipation and continue weaving a tapestry of their own historical imperative and the thread in social and economic freedom. His centenary gives us the opportunity space to remember how we can take inspiration from his life to bring us closer to the world where, and I quote again, we live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others, unquote. The youth of this country and this continent must follow in his footsteps as the promises of social and economic justice are theirs to fulfill. As Madiba famously said on the occasion of his 90th birthday, I quote, it is time for new hands to lift the burdens. It is in your hands now, unquote. Young and old alike, we all have the seeds of the Madiba magic within us to confront the challenges we are facing with a long and with a long our own to freedom. We all have both the ability and the responsibility to touch the lives of those around us and uplift our communities. As we reflect on the previous 100 years, we also look with the legitimate optimism to the next 100 years. It is not by chance that we have amongst us one of the finest global leaders of the 21st century here today to deliver the centennial Nelson Mandela Lecture, President Barack Obama. He is, he is a youthful symbol of transformative leadership on his own right. He's one who has dutifully heeded Madiba's call and taken up firmly in his hands the hard work of leading by example. As the first African-American president and I'm saying intentionally, first African-American president. Barack Obama stands on the shoulders of giants. He too was influenced by generations of greats who came before him. And to paraphrase the words of our revered Maya Angelou, I quote, he came as one, but he sends as 10,000, unquote. So, today we are in the presence of two inspiring symbols. And while he came from different historical contexts and circumstances, Mandela and Obama are symbols of victory over adversity. We have before us a beautiful bridge between the best of leadership of the 20th century to the promise of what is emerging for the 21st century. And here, I want to take the pride as an African mother and grandmother. This beautiful bridge is built by men of African heritage. And this means the best of what we as Africans, we are offering to the world that we can be the best of what humankind can find in situations of adversity, but lead, lead for service. 
rooted in the deep desire to elevate the human condition. Both have been faithful to the dreams and aspirations of their people. They rose to global prominence fueled by their activism at grassroots. And they are loyal to the values and principles instilled in them by their communities, which molded their character and nurtured their inner strength. From the humbles of beginnings, they are representatives of the masses and reached the pinnacle of power and influence. But in doing so, they were able to elevate the rights and ambitions of the disenfranchised and the weak, of young and old, of both men and women, of black and white. And it took us as a human family to a space where we recognize our common humanity and we understand how inextricably connected we are as human race. In his forward to Madiba's book, Conversations with Myself, President Obama writes of Mandela, I quote, his example helped awaken me to the wider world and the obligations that we all have to stand up for what is right. Through his choices, Mandela made it clear that we did not have to accept the world as it is, that we could do our part to seek the world as it should be, unquote. We see how Madiba inspired a young Barack Obama to become an example of leadership for service. From activist and community mobilizer in his hometown, from his seats in the Senate and White House, and to now developing young leaders around the world through the Obama Foundation. I repeat, as the first democratically elected black president of South Africa, Madiba, and the first African American president of the United States. They both hold unique prominence in our consciousness. And for as groundbreaking and iconic as their places in history may be, there is a familiarity that connects us to them. As they emerged from ordinary circumstances, which are not foreign to many of us. A boy from village of Mvezo in the rural Eastern Cape and a community organizer on the south side of Chicago, they give hope and validation to millions of young people around the world who identify with these humble backgrounds. They are proof that condition is no limitation. Once Madiba was asked by one of the Mandela Rhodes scholars, and he asked, what is your dream for this country and this continent? And Madiba replied, my dream? My dream has started already. Here you are. To honor Madiba's legacy is to search and find in every one of us, those values and strengths that enable us to go beyond ourselves, to embrace the bigger causes, to take risks, to make sacrifices for what is right, to be in service to others so that every single human being lives with dignity and in freedom. To celebrate Madiba is to nurture the future where young people who are working in the public and private sectors, within civil society and academia, and in the arts and athletics, in townships and villages, 
in refugee camps and favelas, in slums and suburbs, will have been inspired to seek the world as it should be and become the giants like those we are celebrating here and today. And on behalf and together with those young people I have just talked about, can we all please say, yes, we can. Again, yes, we can. Thank you. It is my singular honor to now to introduce two persons who really don't need any introduction to an audience such as this one. So my task is short and immensely pleasurable. Firstly, President Cyril Ramaphosa. He has been a leader in in, in every sphere in which he has been active, from the university campus, to the trade union movement, from the liberation movement, to the private sector, from political party to government. It feels good once more to have in the highest office in the land a person who has earned our respect. The high regard Nelson Mandela had for him as a leader and as a colleague is well known, and the two had a long association. President Ramaphosa, thank you for agreeing to offer a few words of reflection before we move to the much anticipated lecture by President Obama. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Dumela. Sanbonani. Molweni. Abshin. Dimasiari. Huyemeda. Thank you very much. Program Director, Chairperson of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, 
Professor Jabulo Ndebele, Mama Grasa Michelle, the Mandela and the Michelle families, President Barack Obama, King Zuelitini, the elders collective that was set up by Madiba, represented here by the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, the former President of Ireland, Mary Robinson, Mr. Brahimi, former Foreign Affairs Minister of Algeria, former President Khalema Mutante, Ministers of our government, Premier of Gauteng, David Makura, leaders of various political parties, I saw General Olomisa here, and leaders of non-governmental organizations, faith-based organization leaders, I saw Bishop Lekhanyani, the head of the Mutsipe Foundation, Mr. Patrice Mutsipe, the Chief Executive Officer of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a real pleasure to be here for me to present President Barack Obama, South Africans and indeed many other people around the world are truly humbled and privileged to be participating in this celebration of the centenary of Nelson Mandela, the father of our democracy, and Mama Albertina Sisulu throughout the whole year. I'm sure that many of us who are gathered here will join me in saying that attending this Nelson Mandela annual lecture in the year of Nelson Mandela centenary is indeed a huge and a very rare privilege. But more importantly, it is because President Obama agreed to come that many of us are here today. We'd like to thank the Nelson Mandela Foundation for having extended this invitation to all of us to participate in this historic moment. From the very first lecture, this Nelson Mandela annual lecture has been global in its ambition. It has also been broad and inclusive in its outreach and that is why there are so many of us here today, but many more of our people, South Africans, are watching this lecture live on television and listening on radio. So President Obama, there are millions and millions of South Africans who will be listening to your message today, and we are truly privileged to have this opportunity to listen to you. Those invited to deliver the lecture in the past have included prominent leaders, thinkers, and activists from across the African continent and from across the world. The insights that they shared have reflected on what I would call the human condition. And they have, as they delivered the lectures, touched on issues of poverty, inequality, health, unemployment, and have sought in their lectures to describe the tasks that we must together undertake to advance the well-being of, of a global humanity. In this sense, the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture is a fitting tribute to the life and the meaning of Nelson Kholitlatla Mandela to the people of South Africa, the people of our beloved continent, 
and indeed the people of the world at large. This occasion gives us an opportunity to reflect on Nelson Mandela's life, a man we are all proud to call the founding father of our united, non-racial, non-sexist, and democratic South Africa. The people of South Africa bestowed the title of the father of the nation on Madiba because his struggles and his sacrifices touched the lives of millions and will continue to inspire the generations that will follow. We honor and revere him because he lived his life in the full service of his people. He led us from the wilderness of conflict and oppression into the land of promise, of freedom, democracy, and equality. His vision, his values, and his influence are universal. They cross borders, they span continents, and also reach across time. As we celebrate the 100th anniversary of his birth, as we reflect on an extraordinary life, we are bound to acknowledge that the greatest trait of this son of the African soil was really his humanity. He is hailed as a global icon. He is memorialized as in towering statues in many parts of the world. His likeness adorns our national currency, yet his most enduring accomplishment was to teach us what it means to be a human. As South Africans, we are proud to say that he was one of us, that he was born of us, and he was formed by us, and was a product of us, his people. Yet we know that he belonged to the world. Nelson Kholikla Mandela appealed beyond the boundaries of race, color, class, gender, or nationality, beyond differences of faith, creed, or affiliation. As a leader of his organization, the African National Congress, he ensured that his ANC became the leader of society as a servant of the people. He shared with us many of the same frailties and doubts, the same weaknesses and fears. Like us, he was not perfect. That is why he constantly sought his better self. This makes his life and his contribution all the more remarkable. He demonstrated with greater effect than most the extent of a human's capacity for love, for compassion, and forgiveness, for wisdom, humility, and understanding. Madiba challenged us to reach beyond our grasp to achieve what we thought impossible. He taught us to strive, to struggle, to serve, and to do so selflessly. Now, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of his birth, we are called upon not only to uphold his values and to emulate his humility and his selflessness, we are called upon by Madiba to be active in the struggle for a better South Africa a better Africa and a better world. Madiba's enduring legacy is that he expects us to fight for the interests of the poor, the vulnerable and the marginalized. We are called upon by Madiba to prosecute a progressive struggle against inequality, racial discrimination, ethnic chauvinism and patriarchy. We are called upon 
by Madiba to join hands with like-minded people around the world to resist the domination of global affairs by the rich and the powerful. He calls upon us to heal our nation and to change the world. In the year of renewal, as our nation is filled with renewed hope, with the future, I keep hearing Madiba's voice right into my ear, saying, I am sending you to serve the nation. So fellow South Africans, the Tumamina message was inspired by none other than Madiba. Madiba's spirit is here today. He is sending all of us to deal with all the challenges we face, inequality, and yes, Madiba being the Madiba that we knew and loved, he is also sending all of us to deal with corruption and root it out of South African soil. It is therefore fitting that in this year of Madiba centenary, the Nelson Mandela Foundation has invited President Barack Obama to deliver the 16th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Many people around the world dream of being like Madiba. I have laid in my bed many a times and dreamt of being like Madiba. Many never see their dreams fulfilled. But President Barack Obama somehow found a way to beat many of us in being like Madiba. Like Madiba, he is a Nobel Peace Laureate. That's point number one. Like Madiba, he was the first African-American president to lead his nation. Like Madiba, he is an inspiration to all those who are working and seeking to create a better world. And like, Ma like Madiba, he has an abiding love and commitment to empower young people. Much as there are many similarities, there is one area where President Obama cannot match Madiba. Unfortunately, he cannot dance as well as Madiba can dance. <laughs> and in case you think, like a politician, I'm lying, <laughs> I checked this out with him, and he confessed that, yes, he can do a little bit of a shake, but Michelle Obama is a better dancer than him. <laughs> As South Africans, we celebrated President Obama's election as the 44th President of the United States, not merely because he was a son of this continent, but because he embodied many of the values and aspirations that defined our struggle for liberation. We recognized in him the qualities that we saw in great leaders like Nelson Mandela, humility, wisdom, compassion, as well as an extraordinary ability to inspire hope and to urge a nation to action. We saw a leader who had dedicated a remarkable political life to challenging prejudice and discrimination, to championing the cause of the poor, 
and disenfranchised people and to pursuing justice and equality. In him, we found an American president concerned as much about the fate of humanity as the future of his own countrymen and women, a leader who recognized the indivisibility of the global community and who desired, like us, to forge a common future. In him, President Barack Obama, we found an ally, we found a friend, we found a kindred spirit, and we found a brother. It therefore gives me great pleasure to invite President Barack Obama to deliver the 16th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Mama Grasha, Michelle, members of the Mandela family, Michelle family, to President Ramaphosa, who you can see is inspiring new hope in this great country. <laughs> Professor, Doctor, Distinguished guests, to Mama Sisulu and the Sisulu family, to the, to the people of South Africa, it is a singular honor for me to be here with all of you as we gather to celebrate the birth and life of one of history's true giants. Uh, let me begin by a correction <laughs> and a few confessions. The correction is that I am a very good dancer. <laughs> I just want to be clear about that. <laughs> Michelle is a little better. The confessions. Number one, I was not exactly invited to be here. I was ordered in a very nice way to be here by Grasha Michelle. <laughs> Confession number two. I forgot my geography and the fact that right now it's winter in South Africa. I didn't bring a coat. And this morning I had to send somebody out to the mall because I am wearing long johns. I was born in Hawaii. <laughs> Confession number three. When my staff told me that I was to deliver a lecture, I thought back to the stuffy old professors in bow ties and tweed, and I wondered if this was one more sign 
of the stage of life that I'm entering, <laughs> along with gray hair and slightly failing eyesight. I thought about the fact that my daughters think anything I tell them is a lecture. <laughs> I thought about the American press and how they often got frustrated at my long-winded answers at press conferences when my uh, responses didn't conform to two-minute sound bites. But given the strange and uncertain times that we are in, and they are strange, and they are uncertain, with each day's news cycles bringing more head-spinning and disturbing headlines. I thought maybe it would be useful to step back for a moment and try to get some perspective. So I hope you'll indulge me, despite the slight chill. As I spend much of this lecture reflecting on where we've been, and how we arrived at this present moment in the hope that it will offer us a road map for where we need to go next. Well, 100 years ago, Madiba was born in the village of oh, let's see there, I always get that. I got to get my, my M's right when I'm in South Africa. Bezo. I got it. <laughs> Truthfully, it's because it's so cold, my lips stuck. <laughs> so in his autobiography, he describes a happy childhood. He's looking after cattle, he's playing with the other boys. Eventually, he attends a school where his teacher gave him the English name Nelson. And as many of you know, he's quoted saying, why she bestowed this particular name upon me, I have no idea. There was no reason to believe that a young black boy at this time, in this place, could in any way alter history. After all, South Africa was then less than a decade removed from full British control. Already laws were being codified to implement racial segregation and subjugation, the network of laws that would be known as apartheid. Most of Africa, including my father's homeland, was under colonial rule. The dominant European powers having ended a horrific world war just a few months after Madiba's birth, viewed this continent and its people primarily as spoils in a contest for territory, and abundant natural resources, and cheap labor, and the inferiority of the black race an indifference towards black culture and interests and aspirations was a given. And such a view of the world that certain races, certain nations, certain groups were inherently superior and that violence and coercion is the primary basis for governance that the strong necessarily exploit the weak, that wealth is determined primarily by conquest, that view of the world was hardly confined to relations between Europe and Africa, or relations between whites and blacks. Whites were happy to exploit other whites when they could. And by the way, blacks were often willing to exploit other blacks. 
And around the globe, the majority of people lived at subsistence levels without a say in the politics or economic forces that determined their lives. Often they were subject to the whims and cruelties of distant leaders. The average person saw no possibility of advancing from the circumstances of their birth. Women were almost uniformly subordinate to men. Privilege and status was rigidly bound by caste and color and ethnicity and religion. And even in my own country, even in democracies like the United States, founded on a declaration that all men are created equal, racial segregation and systemic discrimination was the law in almost half the country and the norm throughout the rest of the country. That was the world just 100 years ago. There are people alive today who were alive in that world. It is hard then to overstate the remarkable transformations that have taken place since that time. A second world war, even more terrible than the first, along with a cascade of liberation movements from Africa to Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, would finally bring an end to colonial rule. More and more peoples, having witnessed the horrors of totalitarianism, the repeated mass slaughters of the 20th century, began to embrace a new vision for humanity, a new idea, one based not only on the principle of national self-determination, but also on the principles of democracy and rule of law and civil rights and the inherent dignity of every single individual. In those nations with market-based economies, suddenly union movements developed, and health and safety and commercial regulations were instituted, and access to public education was expanded, and social welfare systems emerged, all with the aim of constraining the excesses of capitalism and enhancing its ability to provide opportunity not just to some but to all people. And the result was unmatched economic growth and a growth of a middle class. And in my own country, the moral force of the civil rights movement not only overthrew Jim Crow laws, but it opened up the floodgates for women and historically marginalized groups to reimagine themselves, to find their own voices, to make their own claims to full citizenship. It was in service of this long walk towards freedom and justice and equal opportunity that Nelson Mandela devoted his life. At the outset, his struggle was particular to this place, to his homeland a fight to end apartheid, a fight to ensure lasting political and social and economic equality for its disenfranchised non-white citizens. But through a sacrifice and unwavering leadership, and perhaps most of all, through his moral example, Mandela and the movement he led would come to signify something larger. He came to embody the universal aspirations of dispossessed people all around the world, their hopes for a better life, the possibility of a moral transformation in the conduct of human affairs.
And Madiba's light shone so brightly, even from that narrow Robben Island cell, that in the late 70s, he could inspire a young college student on the other side of the world to re-examine his own priorities, could make me consider the small role I might play in bending the arc of the world towards justice. And when later, as a law student, I witnessed Madiba emerge from prison just, just a few months, you'll recall, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, I felt the same wave of hope that washed through hearts all around the world. You remember that feeling. It seemed as if the forces of progress were on the march, that they were inexorable. Each step he took, you felt this is the moment when the old structures of violence and repression and ancient hatreds that had so long stunted people's lives and confined the human spirit that all that was crumbling before our eyes. And then, as Madiba guided this nation through negotiation, painstakingly, reconciliation, its first fair and free elections, as we all witnessed the grace and the generosity with which he embraced former enemies, the wisdom for him to step away from power once he felt his job was complete. We understood that We understood it was not just the subjugated, the oppressed who were being freed from the shackles of the past. The subjugator was being offered a gift, being given a chance to see in a new way, being given a chance to participate in the work of building a better world. And during the last decades of the 20th century, the progressive democratic vision that Nelson Mandela represented in many ways set the terms of the international political debate. It doesn't mean that vision was always victorious, but it set the terms, the parameters. It guided how we thought about the meaning of progress and it continued to propel the world forward. Yes, there were still tragedies, bloody civil wars, from the Balkans to the Congo, despite the fact that ethnic and, and sectarian strife still flared up with heartbreaking regularity. Despite all that, as a consequence of the continuation of nuclear detente, a peaceful and prosperous Japan and a unified Europe anchored in NATO and the entry of China into the world's system of trade, all that greatly reduced the prospect of war between the world's great powers. And from Europe to Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, dictatorships began to give way to democracies. The march was on. A respect for human rights and the rule of law, enumerated in a declaration by the United Nations, became the guiding norm for the majority of nations, even in places where the reality fell far short of the ideal. Even when those human rights were violated, those who violated human rights were on the defensive. And with these geopolitical changes came sweeping economic changes, the introduction of market-based principles in which previously closed economies, along with the forces of global integration powered by new technologies, suddenly unleashed entrepreneurial ta talents 
to those that once had been relegated to the periphery of the world economy, who hadn't counted, suddenly they counted, they had some power, they had the possibilities of doing business. And, and then came scientific breakthroughs and new infrastructure and the reduction of armed conflicts. And suddenly, a billion people were lifted out of poverty. And once starving nations were able to feed themselves, and, and infant mortality rates plummeted. And meanwhile, the spread of the internet made it possible for people to connect across oceans. And cultures and continents instantly were brought together. And Potentially, all the world's knowledge could be in the hands of a small child in even the most remote village. That's what happened just over the course of a few decades. And all that progress is real. It has been broad, and it has been deep. And it all happened in what, by the standards of human history, was nothing more than a blink of an eye. And now an entire generation has grown up in a world that, by most measures, has gotten steadily freer and healthier and wealthier and less violent and more tolerant during the course of their lifetimes. It should make us hopeful. But if we cannot deny the very real strides that our world has made since that moment when Madiba took those steps out of confinement, we also have to recognize all the ways that the international order has fallen short of its promise. In fact, it is in part because of the failures of governments and powerful elites to squarely address the shortcomings and contradictions of this international order that we now see much of the world threatening to return to an older, a more dangerous, a more brutal way of doing business. So we have to start by admitting that whatever laws may have existed on the books, whatever wonderful pronouncements existed in constitutions, whatever nice words were spoken during these last several decades at international conferences or in the halls of the United Nations, the previous structures of privilege and power and injustice and exploitation never completely went away. They were never fully dislodged. Caste differences still impact the life chances of people in the Indian subcontinent. Ethnic and religious differences still determine who gets opportunity from Central Europe to the Gulf. It is a plain fact that racial discrimination still exists in both the United States and South Africa. And it is also a fact that the accumulated disadvantages of years of institutionalized oppression have created yawning disparities in income and in wealth and in education and in health, in personal safety, in access to credit. Women and girls around the world continue to be blocked from positions of power and authority. They continue to be prevented from getting a basic education. They are disproportionately victimized by violence and abuse. They're still paid less than men for doing the same work. That's still happening. Economic opportunity for all the magnificence of the global economy, all the shining skyscrapers that have
transformed the landscape around the world, entire neighborhoods, entire cities, entire regions, entire nations have been bypassed. In other words, for far too many people, the more things have changed, the more things stayed the same. And while globalization and technology have opened up new opportunities, have driven remarkable economic growth in previously struggling parts of the world, globalization has also upended the agricultural and manufacturing sectors in many countries, has also greatly reduced the demand for certain workers, has helped weaken unions and laborers' bargaining power, it's made it easier for capital to avoid tax laws and the regulations of nation states. You can just move billions, trillions of dollars with a tap of a computer key. And the result of all these trends has been an explosion in economic inequality. It's meant that a few dozen individuals control the same amount of wealth as the poorest half of humanity. That's not an exaggeration, that's a statistic. Think about that. In many middle-income and developing countries, new wealth has just tracked the old bad deal that people got because it reinforced or even compounded existing patterns of inequality. The only difference is it created even greater opportunities for corruption on an epic scale. And for once solidly middle class families in advanced economies like the United States, these trends have meant greater e economic insecurity, especially for those who don't have specialized skills, people who were in manufacturing, people working in factories, people working on farms. In every country, just about, the disproportionate economic clout of those at the top has provided these individuals with wildly disproportionate influence on their country's political life and on its media on what policies are pursued and whose interests end up being ignored. Now, it should be noted that this new international elite, the professional class that supports them, differs in important respects from the ruling aristocracies of old. It includes many who are self-made, it includes champions of meritocracy. And although still mostly white and male, as a group, they reflect a diversity of nationalities and ethnicities that would have not existed 100 years ago. A decent percentage consider themselves liberal in their politics, modern and cosmopolitan in their outlook. unburdened by parochialism or nationalism or overt racial prejudice or strong religious sentiment. They are equally comfortable in New York or London or Shanghai or Nairobi or Buenos Aires or Johannesburg. Many are sincere and effective in their philanthropy. Some of them count Nelson Mandela among their heroes. Some even supported Barack Obama for the presidency of the United States. And by virtue of my status as a former head of state, some of them consider me as an honorary member of the club. You know, I get invited to these fancy things, you know. They'll fly me out. <laughs> but what's nevertheless true 
is that in their business dealings, many titans of industry and finance are increasingly detached from any single locale or nation state. They live lives more and more insulated from the struggles of ordinary people in their countries of origin. And their decisions, their decisions to shut down a manufacturing plant or to try to minimize their tax bill by shifting profits to a tax haven with the help of high-priced accountants or lawyers, or their decision to take advantage of lower-cost immigrant labor, or their decision to pay a bribe are often done without malice. It's just a rational response they consider to the demands of their balance sheets and their shareholders and competitive pressures. But too often, these decisions are also made without reference to notions of human solidarity or a ground-level understanding of the consequences that will be felt by particular people in particular communities by the decisions that they're made. And from their boardrooms or retreats, global decision makers don't get a chance to see sometimes the pain in the faces of laid off workers. Their kids don't suffer when cuts in public education and health care result as a consequence of a reduced tax base because of tax avoidance. They can't hear the resentment of an older tradesman when he complains that a newcomer doesn't speak his language on a job site when he once worked. They're less subject to the discomfort and the displacement that some of their countrymen may feel as globalization scrambles not only existing economic arrangements but traditional social and religious mores. Which is why at the end of the 20th century, while some Western commentators were declaring the end of history and the inevitable triumph of liberal democracy and the virtues of the global supply chain, so many missed signs of a brewing backlash, a backlash that arrived in so many forms. It announced itself most violently with 9-11 and the emergence of transnational terrorist networks, fueled by an ideology that perverted one of the world's great religions and asserted a struggle not just between Islam and the West, but between Islam and modernity. And an ill-advised U.S. invasion of Iraq didn't help, accelerating a sectarian conflict. Russia, already humiliated by its reduced influence since the collapse of the Soviet Union, feeling threatened by democratic movements along its borders, suddenly started reasserting authoritarian control, and in some cases meddling with its neighbors. China, emboldened by its economic success, started bristling against criticism of its human rights record. It framed the promotion of universal values as nothing more than foreign meddling, imperialism under a new name. Within the United States, within the European Union, challenges to globalization first came from the left, but then came more forcefully from the right. As you started seeing populist movements, which, by the way, are often cynically funded by right-wing billionaires intent on reducing government constraints on their business interests. These movements tapped the unease that was felt by many people who lived outside of the urban cores, fears that economic security was slipping away, that their social status and privileges were eroding that their cultural identities were being threatened by outsiders, somebody that didn't look like them or sound like them or pray as they did. And perhaps more than anything else, 
the devastating impact of the 2008 financial crisis, in which the reckless behavior of financial elites resulted in years of hardship for ordinary people all around the world, made all the previous assurances of experts ring hollow. All, all those assurances that somehow financial regulators knew what they were doing, that somebody was minding the store, that global economic integration was an unadulterated good. Because of the actions taken by governments during and after that crisis, including, I should add, by aggressive steps by my administration, the global economy has now returned to healthy growth. But the credibility of the international system, the faith in experts in places like Washington or Brussels, all that had taken a blow. And a politics of fear and resentment and retrenchment began to appear. And that kind of politics is now on the move. It's on a move at a pace that would have seemed unimaginable just a few years ago. I am not being alarmist, I am simply stating the facts. Look around. Strongman politics are ascendant suddenly whereby elections and some pretense of democracy are maintained, the form of it, but those in power seek to undermine every institution or norm that gives democracy meaning. In the West, you've got far-right parties that oftentimes are based not just on platforms of protectionism and closed borders, but also on barely hidden racial nationalism. Many developing countries now are looking at China's model of authoritarian control combined with mercantilist capitalism as preferable to the messiness of democracy. Who needs free speech as long as the economy is going good? The free press is under attack. Censorship and state control of media is on the rise. Social media, once seen as a mechanism to promote knowledge and understanding and solidarity, has proved to be just as effective promoting hatred and paranoia, and propaganda, and conspiracy theories. So, on Madiba's 100th birthday, we now stand at a crossroads. A moment in time at which two very different visions of humanity's future compete for the hearts and the minds of citizens around the world. Two different stories, two different narratives about who we are and who we should be. How should we respond? Should we see that wave of hope that we felt with Madiba's release from prison, from the Berlin Wall coming down? Should, should we see that hope that we had as naive and misguided? Should we understand the last 25 years of global integration as nothing more than a detour from the previous inevitable cycle of history where might makes right and politics is a hostile competition between tribes and races and religions, and nations compete in a zero-sum game, constantly teetering on the edge of conflict until full-blown war breaks out? 
Is that what we think? Let me tell you what I believe. I believe in Nelson Mandela's vision. I believe in a vision shared by Gandhi and King and Abraham Lincoln. I believe in a vision of equality and justice and freedom and multiracial democracy built on the premise that all people are created equal and they're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. And I believe that a world governed by such principles is possible and that it can achieve more peace and more cooperation in pursuit of a common good. That's what I believe. And I believe we have no choice but to move forward. That those of us who believe in democracy and civil rights and a common humanity have a better story to tell. And I believe this not just based on sentiment. I believe it based on hard evidence. The fact that the world's most prosperous and successful societies, the ones with the highest living standards and the highest levels of satisfaction among their people, happen to be those which have most closely approximated the liberal progressive ideal that we talk about and have nurtured the talents and contributions of all their citizens. The fact that authoritarian governments have been shown time and time again to breed corruption because they're not accountable to repress their people, to lose touch eventually with reality, to engage in bigger and bigger lies that ultimately result in economic and political and cultural and scientific stagnation. Look at, look at history. Look at the facts. The fact that countries which rely on rabid nationalism and xenophobia and doctrines of tribal, racial, or religious superiority as their main organizing principle, the thing that, that holds people together, eventually those countries find themselves consumed by civil war or external war. Check the history books. The fact that technology cannot be put back in a bottle. So we're stuck with the fact that we now live close together and populations are going to be moving. And environmental challenges are not going to go away on their own. So that the only way to effectively address problems like climate change or mass migration or pandemic disease will be to develop systems for more international cooperation, not less. We have a better story to tell. But to say that our vision for the future is better is not to say that it will inevitably win. Because history also shows the power of fear. History shows the lasting hold of greed and the desire to dominate others in the minds of men, especially men. <laughs> history shows how easily people can be convinced to turn on those who look different or worship God in a different way. So if we're truly to continue Madiba's long walk towards freedom, we're going to have to work harder, and we're going to have to be smarter. We're going to have to learn from the mistakes of the recent past. And so, in the brief time remaining, let me just suggest a few guideposts for the road ahead. Guideposts that draw from Madiba's work, his words, 
the lessons of his life. First, Madiba shows those of us who believe in freedom and democracy, we are going to have to fight harder to reduce inequality and promote lasting economic opportunity for all people. Now, I don't believe in economic determinism. I, I, human beings don't live on bread alone. But they need bread. And history shows that societies which tolerate vast differences in wealth feed resentments and reduce solidarity and actually grow more slowly. And that once people achieve more than mere subsistence, then they're measuring their well-being by how they compare to their neighbors and whether their children can expect to live a better life. And when economic power is concentrated in the hands of the few, history also shows that political power is sure to follow and that that dynamic eats away at democracy. Sometimes it may be straight-out corruption, but sometimes it may not involve the exchange of money. It's just folks who are that wealthy get what they want, and it undermines human freedom. And Madiba understood this. This is not new. He warned us about this. He said, where globalization means, as it so often does, that the rich and the powerful now have new means to further enrich and empower themselves at the cost of the poor and the weaker, then we have a responsibility to protest in the name of universal freedom. That's what he said. So if we are serious about universal freedom today, if we care about social justice today, then we have a responsibility to do something about it. And, and I would respectfully amend what Madiba said. I don't do it often, but I'd say it's not enough for us to protest. We're going to have to build. We're going to have to innovate. We're going to have to figure out how do we close this widening chasm of wealth and opportunity, both within countries and between them. And, and how we achieve this is going to vary country to country. And I know your new president is committed to rolling up his sleeves and trying to do so. But we can learn from the last 70 years that it will not involve unregulated, unbridled, unethical capitalism. It also won't involve old-style command and control socialism from the top. That was tried. It didn't work very well. For almost all countries, progress is going to depend on an inclusive market-based system one that offers education for every child, that protects collective bargaining and secures the rights of every worker, that breaks up monopolies to encourage competition in small and medium-sized businesses, and, and has laws that root out corruption and ensures fair dealing in business, that maintains some form of progressive taxation so that rich people are still rich, but they're given a little bit back to make sure that everybody else has something to pay for universal health care and retirement security and invests in infrastructure and scientific research that builds platforms for innovation. I should add, by the way, right now I'm actually surprised by how much money I got. And let me tell you something. I don't have half as much as most of these folks or a tenth or a hundredth. There's only so much you can eat. There's only so big a house you can have. There, there's only so many nice trips you can take. <laughs> I mean, it's enough. You, you, you don't have to, to, to take a vow of poverty 
just to say, well, let me help out a, lot, a few of the other folks. Let, let me look at that child out there who doesn't have enough to eat or needs some school fees. Let me help him out. I'll pay a little more in taxes. It's okay. I can afford it. I mean, it, it shows a poverty of ambition to just want to take more and more and more. Instead of saying, well, I've got so much, who can I help? How can I give more and more and more? That's ambition. That's impact. That's influence. What, what, a, what a, an amazing gift to be able to help people, not just yourself. Where was I? I ad-libbed. <laughs> you get the point. It involves promoting an inclusive capitalism, both within nations and between nations. And as we pursue, for example, sustainable development goals, we have to get past the, the charity mindset We've got to bring more resources to the forgotten pockets of the world through, through investment and entrepreneurship because there is talent everywhere in the world if given an opportunity. When it comes to the international system of commerce and trade, it's legitimate for poorer countries to continue to seek access to wealthier markets. And by the way, wealthier markets, that's not the big problem that you're having. That, that a small African country is, is sending you tea and flowers? That's not your biggest economic challenge. It's also proper for advanced economies like the United States to insist on reciprocity from nations like China that are no longer solely poor countries to make sure that they're providing access to their markets and that they stop taking intellectual property and hacking our <laughs> servers. But, but even as, as there are discussions to be had around trade and commerce, it's important to recognize this reality. While the outsourcing of jobs from north to south, from east to west, while a lot of that was a dominant trend in the late 20th century, the biggest challenge to workers in countries like mine today is technology. And the biggest challenge for your new president, when we think about how we're going to employ more people here, is going to be also technology, because artificial intelligence is here and it is accelerating and you're going to have driverless cars, and you're going to have more and more automated services. And that's going to make the job of giving everybody work that is meaningful tougher. And we're going to have to be more imaginative. And the pace of change is, is going to require us to do more fundamental reimagining of our social and political arrangements to protect the economic security and the dignity that comes with a job. It's not just money that a job provides. It provides dignity and structure and a sense of place and a sense of purpose. And so we're going to have to consider new ways of thinking about these problems, like a universal income, review of our work week, how we retrain our young people, how we make everybody an entrepreneur at some level. But we're going to have to worry about economics if we want to get democracy back on track. Second, Madiba teaches us that some principles really are universal. And the most important one is the principle that we are bound together by a common humanity and that each individual has inherent dignity and worth. Now, it's surprising that we have to affirm this truth today. More than a quarter century after Madiba walked out of prison, I still have to stand here 
at a lecture and devote some time to saying that black people and white people and Asian people and Latin American people and women and men and, 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 and gays and straights, that we are all human, that our differences are superficial, and that we should treat each other with care and respect. I would have thought we would have figured that out by now. I thought that basic notion was well established. But it turns out, as we're seeing in this recent drift into reactionary politics, that the struggle for basic justice is never truly finished. So we've got to constantly be on the lookout and fight for people who seek to elevate themselves by putting somebody else down. And by the way, we also have to actively resist, this is important, particularly in, in some countries in Africa, like my own uh, father's homeland. I, 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 some, I've made this point before. We have to resist the notion that Basic human rights like freedom to dissent or the right of, of women to fully participate in the society or, or the rights of minorities to equal treatment or the rights of uh, people not to be beat up and jailed because of their sexual orientation. We have to be careful not to say that somehow, well, that doesn't apply to us, that those are Western ideas rather than universal imperatives. Again, M M Madiba, you know, he anticipated things. He knew what he was talking about. In 1964, before he received the sentence that condemned him to die in prison, he explained from the dock that the Magna Carta, the Petition of Rights, the Bill of Rights, are documents which are held in veneration by Democrats throughout the world. In other words, he didn't say, well, those folks weren't written by South Africans, so I guess I can't claim them. No, he said, that's part of my inheritance. That's part of the human inheritance. That applies here in this country to me and to you. And that's part of what gave him the moral authority that the apartheid regime could never claim because he was more familiar with their best values than they were. He had read their documents more carefully than they had. And he went on to say political division based on color is entirely artificial. And when it disappears, so will the domination of one color group by another. That's Nelson Mandela speaking in 1964 when I was three years old. What was true then remains true today. Basic truths do not change. It is a truth that can be embraced by the English and by the Indian and by the Mexican and by the Bantu and by the Luo and by the American. It is a truth that lies at the heart of every world religion, that we should do unto others as we'd have them do unto us, that we see ourselves in other people, that we can recognize common hopes and common dreams. And it is a truth that is incompatible with any form of discrimination based on race or religion or gender or sexual orientation. And it is a truth that, by the way, when embraced, actually delivers practical benefits, since it ensures that a society can draw upon the talents and energy and skill of all its people. And if you doubt that, just ask the French football team that just won the World Cup. Because not all of those folks 
Not all of those folks looked like Gauls to me, but they're French. They're French. Now, embracing our common humanity does not mean that we have to abandon our unique ethnic and national and religious identities. But even never stopped being proud of his, his tribal heritage. He didn't, he, he didn't stop being proud of being a black man and being a South African. But he believed, as I believe, that you can be proud of your heritage without denigrating those of a different heritage. In fact, you dishonor your heritage. It, it, it would make me think that you're a little insecure about your heritage if you got to put somebody else's heritage down. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Don't you get a sense sometimes by, again, I'm, I'm mad living here, that, that, that these people who are, are so intent on, on putting people down and, and puffing themselves up that they're small hearted. <laughs> that, 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 that there's, uh, there's something, something they're just afraid of. <laughs> Maniba knew that we cannot claim justice for ourselves when it's only reserved for some. Adiba understood that we can't say we've got a just society simply because we've replaced the color of the person on top of an unjust system. So the person looks like us, even though they're doing the same stuff and somehow now we've got justice. That doesn't work. It's not justice if now you're on top so I'm going to do the same thing that those folks were doing to me. Now I'm going to do it to you. That's not justice. I detest racialism, he said, whether it comes from a black man or a white man. Now we have to acknowledge that there is disorientation that comes from rapid change and modernization and the fact that the world has has shrunk. And we're going to have to find ways to lessen the fears of those who feel threatened. In the West's current debate around immigration, for example, it's not wrong to insist that national borders matter. That's, you know, whether you're a citizen or not, is going to matter to a government, that laws need to be followed, that in the public realm, newcomers should make an effort to adapt to the language and customs of their new home. Those are legitimate things, and we have to be able to engage people who, who do feel as if things are not orderly. But that can't be an excuse for immigration policies based on race or ethnicity or religion. There's got to be some consistency, and we can enforce the law while respecting the essential humanity of those who are striving for a better life. For a mother with a child in her arms, we can recognize that could be somebody in our family. That could be my child. Third, Madiba reminds us that democracy is about more than just elections. You know, when he was freed from prison, Madiba's popularity, well, you couldn't even measure. He could have been president for life. Am I wrong? <laughs> Who was going to run against him? I mean, Ramaphosa was popular, but come on. Plus, he was a young, he was, he was too young. Had he chose, Madiba could have governed by executive fiat unconstrained by checks and balances. But instead, he helped guide South Africa through the drafting of a new constitution. 
drawing from all the institutional practices and democratic ideals that had proven to be most sturdy, mindful of the fact that no single individual possesses a monopoly on wisdom. No individual, not Mandela, not Obama, are entirely immune to the corrupting influences of absolute power if you, if, if, if you can do whatever you want. And everyone's too afraid to tell you when you're making a mistake. No one's immune from the dangers of that. Mandela understood this. He said, democracy is based on the majority principle. This is especially true in a country such as ours, where the vast majority have been systematically denied their rights. At the same time, democracy also requires the rights of political and other minorities be safeguarded. He understood it's not just about who has the most votes, it's also about the civic culture that we build that makes democracy work. So we have to stop pretending that countries that just hold an election where sometimes the, the winner somehow magically gets 90% of the vote because all the opposition is locked up or can't get on TV is a democracy. <laughs> democracy depends on strong institutions, and it's about min minority rights and checks and balances and freedom of speech and freedom of expression and a free press and the right to protest and petition the government and an independent judiciary and everybody having to follow the law. And yes, democracy can be messy, and it can be slow, and it can be frustrating. I know, I promise. <laughs> but the efficiency that's offered by an autocrat, that's a false promise. Don't take that one, because it leads invariably to more consolidation of wealth at the top and power at the top. And it makes it easier to conceal corruption and abuse. For all its imperfections, real democracy best upholds the idea that government exists to serve the individual and not the other way around. And it is the only form of government that has the possibility of making that idea real. So for those of us who are interested in strengthening democracy, it's also stop, it's time for us to stop paying all of our attention to the world's capitals and the centers of power and to start focusing more on the grassroots, because that's where democratic legitimacy comes from, not from the top down, not from abstract theories, not just from experts, but from the bottom up, knowing the lives of those who are struggling. As a community organizer, I learned as much from a laid-off steel worker in Chicago or a single mom in a poor neighborhood that I visited as I learned from the finest economists in the Oval Office. Democracy means being in touch and in tune with life as it's lived in our communities. And that's what we should expect from our leaders. And it depends upon cultivating leaders at the grassroots who can help bring about change and implement it on the ground and can tell leaders that in fancy buildings, this isn't working down here. And to make democracy work, Madiba shows us that we also have to keep teaching our children and ourselves, and this is really hard, to engage with people not only who look different, but who hold different views. This is hard. Most of us prefer to surround ourselves with opinions that validate what we already believe. You notice the people who you think are smart are the people who agree with you. Yeah. Funny how that works. But democracy demands that we're able also to get inside the reality of people who are different than us, 
so we can understand their point of view. Maybe we can change their minds, but maybe they'll change ours. And you can't do this if you just out of hand disregard what your opponents have to say from the start. And you can't do it if you insist that those who aren't like you because they're white or because they're male, that somehow there's no way they can understand what I'm feeling, that somehow they lack standing to speak on certain matters. Uh, Madiba, he lived this complexity. In prison, he studied Afrikaans so that he could better understand the people who were jailing him. And when he got out of prison, he extended a hand to those who had jailed him because he knew that they had to be a part of the democratic South Africa that he wanted to build. To make peace with an enemy, he wrote, one must work with that enemy, and that enemy becomes one's partner. So those who traffic in absolutes when it comes to policy, whether it's on the left or the right, they, they make democracy unworkable. You can't expect to get 100% of what you want all the time. Sometimes you have to compromise. That doesn't mean abandoning your principles, but instead it means holding on to those principles and then having the confidence that they're going to stand up to a serious democratic debate. That's how America's founders intended our system to work. That through the testing of ideas and the application of reason and proof, it would be possible to arrive at a basis for common ground. And I should add, for this to work, we have to actually believe in an objective reality. This is another one of these things that I didn't think I had to lecture about. You have to believe in facts. <laughs> Without facts, there's no basis for cooperation. If I say this is a podium and you say this is an elephant, it's going to be hard for us to cooperate. <laughs> I can find common ground for those who oppose the Paris Accords. Because, for example, they, they might say, well, it's, it's not going to work. You can't get everybody to cooperate. Or, or they might say, it's more important for us to provide cheap energy for the poor, even if it means in the short term that there's more pollution. I, at least I can have a debate with them about that. And I can show them why I think clean energy is the better path, especially for poor countries, that you can leapfrog old technologies. I can't find common ground if somebody says climate change is just not happening when almost all the world's scientists tell us it is. I don't know where to start talking to you about this. If you start saying it's an elaborate hoax, I don't know what to where do we start? Unfortunately, too much of politics today seems to reject the very concept of objective truth. People just make stuff up. They, they just make stuff up. We see it in the growth of state-sponsored propaganda. We see it in internet-driven fabrications. We see it in the, in the blurring of lines between news and entertainment. We see the, the utter loss of shame among political leaders where they're caught in a lie and they just double down and they lie some more. It used to, Look, let me say, politicians have always lied. But it used to be if you caught them lying, they'd be like, oh, man. <laughs> now they just keep on lying. They, they just... I mean, this is, uh, by the way, I, this is what I think uh, Mama Grasha was, was talking about in terms of maybe some sense of humility that Madiba felt. Like, 
sometimes just basic stuff. I, I, me just not completely lying to people, I think it's pretty basic. I, I, didn't, I don't think myself a great leader just because I don't just completely make stuff up. I mean, you, you, you thought, you'd think that was kind of just a baseline. Anyway, we see it in the promotion of anti-intellectualism and the rejection of science from leaders who, who, who find critical thinking and analysis and data somehow politically inconvenient. And as with the denial of rights, the denial of facts runs counter to democracy. It could be its undoing, which is why we have to zealously protect independent media. And we have to guard against the tendency for social media to become a, purely a platform for spectacle and outrage and disinformation. And we have to insist that our schools teach critical thinking to our young people, not just blind obedience. Which I'm sure you are thankful for leads me to my final point. We have to follow Madiba's example of persistence and of hope. It's tempting right now to give in to cynicism, to believe that recent shifts in global politics are too powerful to push back, that the, the pendulum has swung permanently. And just as people spoke about the, the triumph of democracy in the 90s, now you're hearing people talk about the end of democracy and the triumph of tribalism and the strong man. We have to resist that cynicism because, because we've been through darker times. We've been in lower valleys. Yes, by the end of his life, Madiba embodied the successful struggle for human rights. But that journey was not easy. It, it wasn't preordained. The man went to prison for almost three decades. He split limestone in the heat. And he slept in a small cell and was repeatedly put in solitary confinement. And I remember talking to some of his former colleagues, saying how they, they hadn't realized when they were released just the sight of a child. The idea of holding a child, they had missed. They, 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 it wasn't something available to them for decades. And yet somehow his power actually grew during those years. And the power of his jailers diminished because he knew that if you stick to what's true, if you, if, if you know what's in your heart and you're willing to sacrifice for it, even in the face of overwhelming odds, then it might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen next week. It might not even happen in your lifetime. Things may go backwards for a while, but ultimately, right makes might, not the other way around. Ultimately, the better story can win out. And as strong as Madiba's spirit may have been, he would not have sustained that hope had he been alone in the struggle. Part of what buoyed him up was he knew that each year the ranks of freedom fighters were replenishing. Young men and women here in South Africa, in the ANC and beyond, but also black and white and Indian from across the countryside, across the continent, around the world, who in those most difficult days 
would keep working on behalf of his vision. And that's what we need right now. We don't just need one leader. We don't just need one inspiration. What we badly need right now is that collective spirit. And I know that those young people, those hope carriers, are gathering around the world. Because history shows that whenever progress is threatened and the things we care about most are in question, we should heed the words of Robert Kennedy, who spoke here in South Africa. He said, our answer is the world's hope. It is to rely on youth. It's to rely on the spirit of the young. So young people who are in the audience, who are listening, my message to you is simple. Keep believing. Keep marching, keep building, keep raising your voice. Every generation has the opportunity to remake the world. Mandela said, young people are capable when aroused of bringing down the towers of oppression and raising the banners of freedom. Now's a good time to be aroused. Now's a good time to be fired up. And for those of us who care about the legacy that we honor here today, about equality and dignity and democracy and solidarity and kindness, those of us who remain young at heart, if not in body, we have an obligation to help our youth succeed. Some of you know here in South Africa, my foundation's been convening over the last few days 200 young people from across this continent who are doing the hard work of making change in their communities, who reflect Madiba's values, who are poised to lead the way. People like uh, Abbas Mpindi, a journalist from Uganda who founded the Media Challenge Initiative to help other young people get the training they need to tell the stories that the world needs to know. People like Karen Wakoli, who's an entrepreneur from Kenya and founded the Emerging Leaders Foundation to get young people involved in the work of fighting poverty and promoting human dignity. People like Enek Nulanga, who directs the African Children's Mission, which helps children in Uganda and Kenya get the education that they need, and then in his spare time, Enoch advocates for the rights of children and founded an organization called Lead Minds Africa, which does exactly what it says. You meet these people, you talk to them, they will give you hope. They are taking the baton. They know they can't just rest on the accomplishments of the past, even the accomplishments of those as momentous as Nelson Mandela's. They stand on the shoulders of those who came before, including that young black boy born 100 years ago. But they know that it is now their turn to do the work. Madiba reminds us that no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart. Love comes more naturally to the human heart. Let's remember that truth. Let's see it as our North Star. Let's be joyful in our struggle to make that truth manifest here on Earth so that 100 years from now, future generations will look back and say they kept the march going. That's why we live under new banners of freedom. Thank you very much, South Africa. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, if we could have our seats. President Obama, it is a work of dreams to speak after you. And as you said in your own speech, a vision come manifest for all the little girls and the little boys who are sitting in this audience today. They are here, they are wearing their school uniforms, they are from all over the country. And they have solely come to hear from you what it is that they can do to make the world that you dream of a possibility. When my father introduced me to your campaign, I was only 14 years old and I barely understood what it meant to unite people around a politics of purpose. The purpose that you have been given to rebuild in moments of crisis. President Ramaphosa, the purpose that you have been given to rebuild a country that is struggling economically to make freedom something that is a living reality for all South Africans. Ladies and gentlemen, our own purpose to make this country work for all those who live in it. And when we say make it work for people who live in it, we don't mean idealizing our freedom because we can lose it. The maintenance of our freedom requires us to take responsibility. And Mandela himself said in Long Walk to Freedom, I quote, I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, the only one, uh, the only, one only finds, sorry, that there are many more hills to climb. I have taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come, but I can only rest for a moment. For with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. May we learn from Madiba to be inspired by the gains that we have made as a country and as a globe to move forward and achieve more towards the entrenchment of justice, of dignity, and of freedom. Amanda! Away to! Ladies and gentlemen, before I close, I want to acknowledge the following kings who are also here King Mabena, King. Sikdawu, King Damase, King Sekukune, and the acting king of Abatembu, you are welcome today. And finally, fellow South Africans, we have reached the end of our event, but I want us to stay put to listen to the closing remarks and the way forward from the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Mr. Silo Hata. Thank you very much, uh, Busi, for those lovely remarks. Mr. President, I don't know if I'm allowed to also tell one little truth. I think you also admitted backstage that Mrs. Marshall beats you at dancing. <laughs> I have no doubt that you all feel as inspired as I do at this moment. President Obama, your analysis is at once sobering and stirring. You explain the global challenges with extraordinary clarity. They are many, they are daunting, yet you also name what I could call a space of opportunity in which humanity can rise to the challenges. You enable us to hear the call to active citizenship the call to take responsibility for ourselves, for our communities, and for the earth. Thank you for reminding us 
that the past continues to haunt us. That you should remember to, to, to be hopeful even when we faced with these daunting challenges. That even with change that comes, we must treat it with suspicion. That we can go back if we are not careful to what we had. That racism remains a reality, a global reality. Women's struggles remain something that we need to deal with. That Palisa Madiba should have graduated from UJ. That we are on the right track, having established the Atlantic Fellows for Racial Equity. That things change only to stay the same if we are not careful but that democracy must save the poor and the vulnerable. I like how you presented fake news without calling it fake news. <laughs> but you also said dreaming is not enough. We have to work hard. How can one forget that you challenged us again, especially the, the rich, that we must reach a point where we say, there is something called enough. Mr. President, we get the point. I found your thinking on the legacy of Nelson Mandela compelling. Like us at the foundation, for you, legacy is not something that is placed in safe hands to be preserved, pristine and unchanging. Instead, legacy is offered to all hands and over time has meaning and significance only as it is, it is put to work in ever-changing contexts. Of course, a legacy being put to work over time will be reinterpreted, will be critiqued, will be challenged. I'm sure that you have heard about the sometimes robust critiques that especially young South Africans are offering in relation to the life and work of Madiba. All the time nowadays, I find myself in difficult conversations about the compromises that Madiba and his associates made during transition to democracy. Just recently, for example, at a public event at Libonez, the second school in, at Royal Bafugeng, I was directly challenged by an angry young woman named Buipilo Baiti, who is here. Let's just say, Mr. President, she gave me a rough time. The more I responded, the more she came back with what Google says. And the more I tried to explain that Google could be wrong, the more she found new ways of coming back. And it then told me that we must continue to engage to be greater listeners than those who just give our opinion without embracing difference. That we must continue to embrace, that's why Buipilo is here today. In context of contest contestation, the imperative is to engage, to create safe enough spaces for all voices to be heard, to make dialogue an engine of transformation. It is no accident that Madiba gave the foundation that mandate. So for us, dialogue is not just about polite conversation, in fact, Madiba once told my predecessor, Ahmad Dango, that when you have two people in the room who agree with one another, it is not dialogue, it is a chat. Real dialogue is if we put people together in the room who don't even want to see one another. This is why increasingly our work is focused in the intersections of structural inequality, poverty and racism. At the time of the 13th Nelson Mandela annual lecture, which was delivered by the world-renowned economist Thomas Piketty, we launched together with the think tank of scholars and activists, the Mandela Initiative on Poverty and Inequality. That initiative's final report will be published in due course. How is it possible that one in four South Africans are stunted by the time they reach six years of age? How is it possible that a map of South Africa today depicting the areas of highest poverty levels 
looks like nothing so much as an apartheid map of the Bantu stands. How is it possible that most black children in crashes are actually in detention centers because the owners do not qualify for state subsidies? I could go on and on. My point is that South Africa, we have still not transformed, we have not still transformed the societal patterning of apartheid racial capitalism. Yes, we must clean up the mess. Yes, we must fix what is broken. But most importantly, we must make the structures of power work for the most vulnerable. If we are go to, going to get this right, then we will need presidents who give half their salaries to early childhood development and who grasp the nettle. So that half salary is still expected, Mr. President. So we must still grab the nettle on the distribution of land and other forms of wealth. We'll need citizens who take responsibility for making their communities refuge, refuges for springboards rather than dumping grounds. Today we want to honor two such citizens, both of whom are here today. These are community-based activists and practitioners who are the Nelson Mandela who the Nelson Mandela Foundation has the privilege to work with. Abram Khadi, Khari rather, runs the Oratile Early Childhood Development Center in Deep Slot. He started the center because he wanted to make a difference in the lives of children. He's also the chairperson of the Deep Slot ECD Forum, which has about 133 members. Many ECD centers in informal settlements and townships areas take children with the knowledge that some parents in their communities would not be able to afford to pay anything towards their children's education. These centers take them on regardless of, as they recognize that children should not be disadvantaged owing to the financial positions of the families they come from. I would like us to please recognize two of these people which are Medikeledi Ramatoka and Ntate Abram Khari, who are sitting, there they are, if they can please. Uh... So ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, President Obama has given me much to think about. He has inspired us to, us to think carefully and maybe differently about the work Madiba has mandated us to do. We thank you, Mr. President. So it remains for me to thank the many people and organizations who have supported this Nelson Mandela annual lecture, not least all of you who came today in this cold. And in fact, uh, watching, looking through the audience, you could see who went to Russia to watch the World Cup because of the hats that they were wearing. So I'd like to, just at this point, thank the Motsipe Foundation for being a partner that you have been. <laughs> Airports Company South Africa for continuing to be our supporter. Uber, Coca-Cola Company of South Africa, the Coca-Cola Company rather, Africa Master Block Chain Company, APSA, Brand South Africa. City of Johannesburg, Distel, Altron, Ndalo Media, who produced the booklet that you have, which is a collector's item. We thank them. Spear, Tebe Group, who provided you with the blankets that you have. Tsukhosan, Edcon, the Presidential Group, Audi, Vodacom, Bataung Legacy, and Old Mutual. I also want to thank two companies, and the president was talking about how we should
welcome a, a music tribute that will be given by Tandiswa Mazwai, Kirk Wallam, and Soweto Gospel Choir. And uh, our dignitaries will stay on the stage for the first song and then halfway through the second one. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you. 